this is the first time I've actually had an opening band before I actually came up to the stage. I've never had people play music for me before I came onto the stage. Before. I've had a heckler. <laughs> but this is, this is something else completely. Don't you start. <laughs> I don't know who you were, but I know people. I can have you rejected. <laughs> My wife is here. She'll kick your ass. <laughs> I got, I got to try something here because I was promised that uh, that there, if I if I did particular hand movements that they would make little punchy sounds just like you know you see off of uh, uh, the. Uh, <laughs> I, this is it's like taunting a retriever, isn't it? All right, all right. You were a little early. Okay, let's. Okay, ready. <laughs> you don't want me to do the rejoinder to that one. So, uh, first off, thank you all for coming to Shaikon 7. So, hey, quiet! It's all about me for the next three minutes. <laughs> <sighs> thank you all for coming to Shaikon 7, the seventh Worldcon here in the beautiful town of Chicago. <laughs> you can tell because there's a seven. That's exactly what that is. We're very, very, very excited about that. And I have to tell you that uh, I, I'm, I'm really grateful for two reasons. One, to be your uh, Toastmaster and your MC for the Hugos. And second, I know my wife is grateful because you managed to get me into a suit jacket. <laughs> She's, she saw me just a few minutes ago. She came, came up, she says, where's, where's your tie? I said, I have a tie. She says, where is it? I said, it's underneath the desk. <laughs> So, there you go. This is what I call the Paul Ryan casual. <laughs> That's the only political joke I'll be making today. Now, I want to say, I mean, I love world cons, uh, but this is actually, I'm still relatively speaking, relative to, say, uh, Silverberg, or relative to Earl Korshak, who's here today. I'm still a world con newbie. My very first world con was in 2003. At, uh, at Toronto. And I still remember being very excited to go to my very first Worldcon and going to the airport and going up to the desk at the, at the airline and going, I'm going to Worldcon in Toronto. They said, that's great. Do you have a passport? <laughs> and I went, though, because did you know Toronto is in an entirely different country? <laughs> So I drive back home, and I get in my car, and I zoom across two different countries. Uh, it's really different when you speed in kilometers rather than speeding in miles. It seems to go much faster. I make it to my panel, my very first panel, five minutes before it begins. And I do this. I sit down and I go, oh, oh my god. I can't believe it. This is my very first panel. I just made it. I just drove all the way from Ohio. I've never done this before. They said, great, you're the moderator. <laughs> very exciting times, very exciting times. And later that night, um, I went to the tour party at TorCon, no relation. And, uh, and I didn't know anybody. And so I just decided just to wander around. And I went into this room, and there was a sort of an older, distinguished-looking gentleman sort of standing there by, by a dresser. So I went over, you know, he looked a little lonely, maybe didn't anybody know him, so I decided to go over and talk to him. He was very polite and quiet, and we had a nice discussion, and he just seemed really interesting, like the most interesting man in the world, you know, the guy in the Dos Equis commercials? This guy sucks compared to the guy I was talking to. It was wonderful, and I was just, and then he wandered off, he said goodbye. I was like, well, I've done my good day today. I've talked to a lonely old man. Um, <laughs> and I turned to the other guy that I was, I was standing next to, and I was like, who is it that I was talking to? And he looked at me, and he's like, it's Robert Silverberg, you idiot! <laughs> that, was the, that was the first time I ever met Robert Silverberg. <laughs> he's really good friends with me now. <laughs> I pay for his drinks every time I see him. <laughs> But 
Chicago, such a wonderful city. Got to tell you, I mean, I actually have a little bit of history with Chicago uh, in that I actually went to the University of Chicago. Uh, as, as did your uh, guest of honor, uh, Mike Resnick. I actually managed to escape with a degree. He escaped with five Hugos, so you tell me. Uh, and, but it's just, it's just very exciting to be back. I, I sort of feel a sort of kinship with Chicago that I didn't feel actually when I first came to it, because I originally came from California. And uh, I remember flying into Chicago and having a friend pick me up and looking around and being absolutely stunned that here in Chicago you have buildings that are over 50 years old. <laughs> it's amazing to me. I was like, what is that? What do, what do, you, what do you call that thing? It's called brick. <laughs> what? I thought that was only used in fables and stories. No, it's an actual building material. Aren't you worried about earthquakes? <laughs> Things are different, apparently. <laughs> and I went to the University of Chicago and I started talking to people. And I had grown up with the impression that I, I you know, had the standard American accents. And uh, then someone said to me, after about five minutes of talking to them, you're from California, aren't you? It's like, oh my god! How do we know? Just uh, so an entirely, entirely different world. And now, even now, they, there was actually just something in the news recently. They were talking about the northern city's accent, where they were talking about how up in like uh, Chicago and Milwaukee and Minneapolis, and they always flatten their vowels. And uh, that this was apparently taking linguists by storm, that they'd never actually noticed it. And I'm like, my god, didn't you watch Bill Swirsky's super fans on Saturday Night Live? The Bears? Chicago? It just seems, I mean, uh, every time I come up and I, I, uh, Dave McCarthy, I talk to him, and I'm just like, wow, you're an entire linguistic study in and of yourself. <laughs> I mean, like I said, I'm a relative newbie to all this sort of stuff. 2003, my very first Worldcon, you know, uh, and uh, and so here, less than a decade later, to actually be the Toastmaster. This is so amazing to me, and I'm trying to figure out how this happened. And is it is it because you know I've been fortunate enough to win a Campbell, a couple of Hugos, have been fortunate enough to be president of CIFLA? Am I fortunate uh, to to have some books that have sold pretty well? And I think really, the actual answer is, I'm fortunate enough that Dave McCarty was high. <laughs> so Dave, to you, and to your dealer. <laughs> Thank you so very much. opening ceremony for you today. We're going to get right to it with our first guest. But before we do anything else, we have some special announcements for all y'all. Our guitarist, what's your name, sir? Gundo. Gundo is going to uh, tell them to you. Take it away, Gundo. Shycon is proud to announce the past and future of electronic gaming. Spend your time playing ancient console games from the 1980s to totally immersive battle pods. Compete against your friends in 10 meter tall killer robots or fly across the red planet in a demolition derby, which will be broadcast by Curiosity. <laughs> Located on the concourse, free to all ShyCon 7 members. It gave me a desk. I feel so grown up now. <laughs> all right, well, our first guest actually, in many ways, is one of the first people ever involved in a ShyCon. Uh, he is one of the co-chairs uh, of ShyCon 1 way back in 1940. Good Lord, were people even alive then? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Earl Korshak.
I'm doing pretty well, thanks. Oh, good. I'm glad you... Shycon 7. Shycon 7? I'm talking Shycon 1. Well, no, I mean, but just think, just the rich panoply of Shycons that we have to discuss here today. All right. And just, you know, and just the fact that we've, that from 1940 and from where, where we were, we've actually gotten all the way to Shycon 7. I mean, how does that make you feel as the founding Shycon father? <laughs> I mean, besides... It makes, me, it makes me feel glad that I'm still alive. <laughs> So Shaikon 7 was that, or Shaikon 1 was actually the second World Con. Is that correct? That's correct. And so did you go to the to the first one, kind of look around, and go, I could do this. <laughs> what was what was what was the thinking there? Well, our thinking at that time was that that was probably going to be the only World Con. I'm talking about New York in 1939. Right. And I went there with the with a friend of mine who was also the chairman, actually the chairman before me mm. of Shaikon. And he came up with the most brilliant idea, a fellow by the name of Mark Reinsberg, and he came up with the most brilliant idea. He said, let's do this every year. And he said, and we'll, what we'll do is, he made the suggestion. Nobody had thought of doing this annually. Right. He says, we'll do it, and he says, we'll do it four ways across the country. He says, New York, Chicago, Denver, Los Angeles. And that's the way the first four World, world Cons were done. This one guy just thought of the idea. I mean, it was an obvious idea, but he came up with it, and he should be really remembered for that. Yeah, that's a really great, uh, really great idea. It also seems to me that it seems weird because in fan isn't there the thing in fandom that if you do something once, it's a tradition, and if you do it twice, it's a hollow tradition? <laughs> <laughs> it seems to me like at the end of the first Worldcon, they were like, "This is awesome. We're all nerds together, and we're drunk. We should do this every year." <laughs> Unfortunately, the first Worldcon had a great, a great problem. There was a thing called the Exclusion Act, and uh, there were a group of people who were known as the Futurians, and a group of people known as the Fandomites. The Fandomites people put on the convention, and they excluded the Futurians. This made a very bad feeling in the field. The Futurians, by the way, were some of the most famous and prominent people in our field. They were headed by Donald A. Walheim, Frederick Pohl, uh, Dave Kyle, uh, Asimov was a member, uh, Damon Knight was a member. That was the Futurians. That group was, was ex excluded from the World Con in New York. And the reason behind it was that uh, the people that ran the, the, the convention thought that they were, quote, communists. <laughs> So their response was, we'll show you. We'll found modern science fiction. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, anyway, it was a great idea to take it out of New York, bring it to Chicago, because we weren't involved in any factions or any of that type of thing. And we had a, what, just a small group here that put on the World Con. Uh, that was myself and Mark Reinsberg and another guy who was one of the most famous of all fans, uh, Wilson Bob Tucker. with the people that, that put on the Shaikon 1. So, now, how many people attend Shaikon 1? Well, according to the booklet that I see here, they said something about a little over 100, and I suppose that's about right. I thought it was more like 150, but they seem to suggest 129. I'll buy their number. So basically, the first two rows here. I'm sorry. <laughs> the first two rows here in the audience. Two rows, exactly. <laughs> It's, so it's, it's the world kind of grown just a little since, it has since indeed. the old days. It has indeed. And, and, and do, you feel, do you feel sort of proud about that? That's something that you had a hand at, or that you were there. You mentioned to me just a few minutes ago that you were the, actually uh, the only person who attended all 15 of the, of the first world Cup. That's a fact. Uh, and so, so having uh, seen it from when it was just a, a bunch of guys hanging out in a, basically in a, in a room to becoming a lot more guys hanging out in the room. Uh, I mean, just a few people, the same ones were there every year. <laughs> I mean, but do you feel, you, I mean, if, if it were me, I'd be sitting there going, yes, I did this. I, I mean, that actual real sense of accomplishment. I mean, do you, do you feel it? I think you should have it. Do you feel you should have this sense of accomplishment? I'm on the spot anyway, but go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, but how do you feel about that? This is, this is, like I said, in many ways it's your baby. Well, it, uh, it's, it's, it's great, and 
And all I can say is I've enjoyed it. Uh, I was, I was, I've been at this all my life. As I say, I was uh, at the first World Con, the first 15, dropped out of the field for a while, was active, active as a book publisher for many years. And uh, finally, when I got to be 49 years of age, I decided to go to law school. <laughs> and I went to law school and uh, have had a very successful career in the law. Well, we're very glad to have you here. I hope that you, when you look around at uh, the Chevron Seven this year, that you kind of that you're sitting there going, "Well, maybe I'll do this better next year." Carl <laughs> <laughs> Korshak, thank you so much. Thank you. He's a busy man. He actually has to go to another panel. So. <laughs> Now we have another message from your convention staff, and when we come back, Mike Resnick will be here. Chicago is celebrating Chicago's fine theatrical tradition. Mobius Theater returns to Chicago after a 12-year hiatus with a radio presentation of H.G. Wells' The Island of Dr. Moreau at 8 p.m., Friday right here in the Grand Ballroom. There will also be two presentations of a pair of plays based on the writings of a little-known Midwestern author, Neil Gaiman. <laughs> His Snow Glass Apples and Troll Bridge will debut at, on Friday at 1.30 in Columbus CD with an encore presentation on Sunday, same game and time, same game and channel. The game and plays are mature audience only. Think of it as BG-16. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, do you really need me to introduce this next guy to you? He is your Worldcon guest of honor. He is a Chicago son. He is Mike Resnick. Those lights from 1991, uh, I had the uh, Toastmaster the Masquerade, uh -huh. and I had notes, and I couldn't read them, right. and I had a guy in the front row who was going to give me hand signals uh -huh. on whether to go faster or slower based on what was happening backstage, and I couldn't see him with those lights, right. and I was standing with my back to a curtain, and somebody reached out from under the curtain and began stroking my leg. <laughs> I decided either that meant he was in love with me or uh, I should go faster. And I ran my leg like that and I assumed that meant go slower. And we did that for an hour and a half. <laughs> they haven't changed those bolts. With some loose sum, the Hugo Award winning and nominated uh, short science fiction and fantasy of Mike Resnick. Yeah. See, now this is actually like a real talk show. You're here to promote product. <laughs> I'm very proud about that. Well, so, ISFIC Press is, um, ISFIC is Illinois Science Fiction Society. Right. And it began in 1973 when they decided to start putting on Wendy Cons to prove they could hold a World Con. And I'm one of the founding members, one of the first five. And mm -hmm. the reason is we decided to incorporate, and only five of us had $25 in our pocket. <laughs> and that's what it cost. <laughs> that is so fandom. <laughs> so, uh, uh, so this whole uh, guest of honor thing, at, uh, at a Worldcon thing, and in Chicago. Of all, of all places. I was born 10 miles that direction at, at the University of Chicago, Billings Hospital. So there was, there was like foreshadowing that is basically Absolutely. what you saying. <laughs> so as, as, a, as a native son, as a, how does it feel to be in Chicago for the actual uh, World Con as the guest? Uh, I like Chicago, always did. Uh, we spent Monday taking a nostalgia tour around the houses we used to own on yeah. the North Shore. Yeah. And yesterday we went to, uh, or the day before, we went to the Field Museum, which is the best natural history museum in the world. Right. And, uh, if any of you guys are looking for a place
place to eat, try the Greek islands. We, we don't have any Greek, Greek food in Cincinnati, but that's the best Greek restaurant around. Right. And uh, this is a wonderful hotel for a world cup. Oh yeah, uh, no, it's great. I don't, I don't want to say anything too bad about Montreal, but they had half the people in ten hotels. <laughs> I mean, they spent more time walking than partying. Well, let me uh, let me ask you this. I mean, when you were when you were doing sort of your nostalgia tour, I mean, how is Chicago now versus Chicago then? Well. I live in Cincinnati now, and they don't build anything in Cincinnati, they just refurbish. Right. Whereas in Chicago, everything's new. We lived out in the middle of the country, on a corner of Adlai Stevenson's old estate. Uh, it was broken into five and ten acre chunks, and everybody out there bred either dogs, which we did, or horses. Mm -hmm. And now all they breed are brick buildings that sell things. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, it's odd, because I was here, well, I went to the University of Chicago, like you did, and I graduated about uh, 20... 1991, so 21 years ago, uh, and I come back, even just at the University of Chicago campus, and things are so different. They started spending money on the students after I left, and I can't help but take it personally. Well, I didn't spend any when I was there. They certainly, they certainly didn't spend it on the buildings. Yeah. Uh, I left needing six hours for my degree in, in 1961, mm -hmm. and I still need six hours, so you can tell how important I think your college is. <laughs> You can still go back, they'd still give you those six hours. It's probably just physical education requirement. <laughs> Actually, I, I, I won some letters on their fencing thing. It was easier than going out for track. Yeah. Than I, did, I, did, I, well, I just did the straight-up PE, and I actually uh, did the archery, because my, my brother, when I was 12, gave me, uh, gave me a bow and said, come on, we're hunting for squirrels. And, uh, I never got, you know, I, I was not, you know, the squirrel whisperer or anything like that, but by the time that I got there, I was a pretty good shot, so I was just like, you know, I would go up with, the, you know, they, they would bring everybody the little uh, pinky boats, oh, yeah. like a 20-pound draw, you could draw them back with your pinky, and I actually had my bow with me because it's the south side, and... Uh, <laughs> Well, when I was there, uh, I stayed in something called the Burton Judson Dormitories, which is the only part of the university south of the long strip known as the Midway. Right, right. And the Midway uh, slopes down for about 20 feet and then is like a football field, right. or a number of them. And all the classes were on the other side. Sure. And the only people who never got mugged crossing the Midway the whole year I was there were the members of the fencing team, because we'd walk across the Midway with our sabers. <laughs> Which played on us, we were in happiness. <laughs> <laughs> now, um, Mike, you and I have a little bit of a rivalry this year. Uh, you and I are nominated in the same category. Well, I've already got three people to trip you going up to the stage. <laughs> <laughs> but your plans are foiled because I'm giving them away. Not, not the short story. No, that's true. In fact, I was supposed to give away anything you were nominated for, and then I, I cheated and got the same category. The bitter, bitter irony. So yeah, now it's Gregory Dutrois, and I can already tell what he's going to say. He's like, he's going to get up there and say, it, you're late on your story. Because <laughs> I, am, I am actually late on the story of Gregory Dutrois. So. Uh, but uh, I just want you to know that I'm perfectly happy to lose to you this year. Well, I just want you to know that I'm perfectly happy with that as well. <laughs> Excuse me, Rowena Morrill, who is uh, also a guest of honor, is unfortunately unable to be here, but we have literally the next best thing. Her sister, Kathy, will come to speak about her sister. But first, Gundo! In this very room on Saturday at 8 p.m., come to see the greatest in costuming when ShyCon 7 presents this year's Worldcon Masquerade. The following night at 8 p.m., this room will host the premier science fiction awards. The fan-voted Hugo Awards will be presented at a ceremony open to all members. Ah. See this awesome art? There. Now? There we go. Is that better? It's done by Romina Morrill. She is our uh, artist guest of honor. Unfortunately, uh, medical issues kept her from us. But as I said, her sister is here to spread vicious rumors, and that's the next best thing. So please welcome Kathy Morrill. It's not working. They're I was going to say, I, apparently I can't dance. 
dance, but I can trip on my way home. So, and I I see what you mean about those lights. They're, they're like, really amazing. I, I really do feel like I should be sitting going, there are four lights! <laughs> I really love the fact that I am at a place where that joke gets applause. So, thank you all. Well, first off, how's your sister? She's doing very well, thank you. Just not quite up to the rigors of a full convention. She's, the last word she said as uh, we got in the car to drive here was, I wish I could go too. So she misses you and sends all her best wishes to you back. Great. You know, frankly, all they, they only had her on 12 different things, you know, so it's not like, you know, it was a hectic schedule or anything. Yeah, so. Yeah. Uh, so actually, tell me, uh, I'm, I, I'm someone, I, I recognize your, your sister's work on site, but I don't know anything about her that, give me a, a little bit of an anecdote of her that will make me feel like I know her personally. No pressure. <laughs> Well, we, um, our father was a military chaplain in the army, and so we moved all over the world. I happen to have been born in Japan. You can see a lot of those influences in her work. So there's a lot of, you know, pagodas, and, and she always had a very vivid ma imagination growing up. I'm the youngest of the four of us, and it was always Rowena's great idea, and the rest of us just kind of followed along in her footsteps. One memorable occasion when a bird killed itself by flying into a window, she decided we had to entomb it like a pharaoh. And so we out, went out the backyard and dug this thing and did rituals and embalmed the bird. So anyway, you can see from a very early age, she had a very uh, just fertile imagination. But I think an anecdote that is the most interesting is that she did not start as an artist. She started as a classical pianist and went to college and majored in that. Our mother is also a musician, so she is a multi-talented person. She got into art later in her, her early 20s. She happened to take an art course, and then it was like going up in flames. She just was consumed by the field. So she basically went through like the entire sort of creative teen years without like like drawing or doing any of that sort of she stuff? She never, ever did that. I am intensely jailed. Justin, I hate her very much now. <laughs> hey, come on! You know, it's not... So she, she, was, she was a very... She was a good pianist, right? Oh, she was a fabulous so she's So she's got this, this great, you know, fallback job. Yes, she does. <laughs> I know, get better. And then she just goes off and... and Jeez! Yeah. Overachieve <laughs> much! Yes, yes. Goodness gracious. And that, by the way, the original for that is in the gallery or one of the art, the art shows yeah. down there. So oh, okay, great. And one of the things that I've always, she is a terrific perfectionist, as you know, any of you who have actually looked at her art, and one anecdote was that one of her early books, she had an intro by Theodore Sturgeon, and he was talking about, you know, the brush strokes or something, and she said, brush strokes. <laughs> so if you look at her originals, they are, they're just, they're flawless. She is just an amazing technician, wonderful imagination, and uh, just a wonderful sister. Mm. Yeah, you're just saying that because she's not here, right? <laughs> you know, it's not, you she know, slipped I, me a bunch of money. That was, I wish yeah, I could hear you. Here you there we go. No, no, so, now, how much, how much older is she than, than you are? She's eight years older. Than okay, me. so. We have two sisters in between. And, and so, so all sisters. Um, all sisters. You could have you could have done like a comedy troupe on the road or something. She plays piano. You do the seltzer waters. Well, no, like we were all singers actually. Oh really? Yes, I'm still a singer, and so we did a lot of singing in the car. And that was the other thing that my parents thought was so funny. They'd be in the front seat, and one of our gigs was that one of us would be a piano bench on the back seat. You know the old cars that had the wide back. You know. Yeah, um, no seat belts. And no seat belts. I was usually the keyboard on the back window sill because I was the smallest. And then she would be sitting on the bench, and then she'd be playing me. And then if we'd go around a corner, we'd all fall over, and then we'd be screaming and yelling at each other. And then it would all stop, and then we'd all sweetly sing again for the next. <laughs> so that was that was a moral family trip in a nutshell. And we crisscrossed the country many times because we 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 moved about every year or so in the army. We do a lot. Jerrica, I don't want to be a piano. I want to be an oboe. As the youngest, I was, well, we, she also wrote a lot of plays that we put on for our parents. <laughs> <laughs> I was often the spider.
hider under the gray blanket. You get under the gray blanket and scurry out when you're told. <laughs> so we did plays, we sang, we did music, we, we did everything. If she cooks, I'm going to marry her. <laughs> she does cook. Oh. <laughs> you're killing me here. Oh, goodness gracious. Well, we're very sorry that she could not be here, but we're very glad that you are here. And uh, so her, her art is down in the art show. Her art is in the art show, and I will um, be doing her presentation tonight at 9. I guess all of you are going to be the planetarium, but that was how I was slotted in. But I will be, I have about uh, 50 images to uh, put on screen, and we went through them together two nights ago, and she has given me some personal anecdote about each one of them. So I will do my feeble best to... Uh, give a, a good presentation tonight. Great. Everyone, Kathy Moore. When we come back, Jane Frank is going to give us the ins and outs of the agentry world. But first, I know what I don't have uh, is an agent for being an artist. And now I know that my life is incomplete, especially since I've met the preeminent artist's agent, ladies and gentlemen, Jane Frank. <laughs> I feel like I should like launch up and I have a cape, but it doesn't actually work that way. So, so, so they recreated a room in your house. Yes. Isn't that weird? Very. I mean, don't you? I mean, just uh, what was what was the? Uh, this sounds the wrong way to put it, I suppose. But what was the thinking then? I mean, what was the thinking of like not just not just the artwork, but the actual room itself? Well, um, we have a history actually of naming rooms, so the name of the room came after the inspiration for the room. Okay. And the inspiration for the room was the writings of H. Ryder Haggard, Henry Ryder Haggard, one of our favorite authors, mm -hmm. and we had collected his books. And uh, I have to take credit for this crazy, obsessive idea <laughs> of uh, waking up one day and saying, what we need, what we need is to commission good artists to... Uh, translate to interpret these books for us mm -hmm. because most of these books or at least the first editions were out of print they didn't have book jackets or if they did long gone mm -hmm. and we wanted to capture the essence of these books and so who better to turn to than the preeminent commercial artists of the day and sure. so we decided we would art direct and four years later <laughs> a little bit longer than we had anticipated we finally had our 10 or 11 paintings right. representing our favorite works of H. Ryder Haggard. Not all of the works, but right. favorite ones. So in that entire room, did you just not use the room? It's like, don't go in there, there are ghosts? What? Uh, no. Uh, when, we, when we first got the idea for this, we said, we can't just hang these paintings anywhere because mm -hmm. it would be out of place. Right. I mean, they're supposed to be uh, reproducing the ideas of Victorian Asians, so we decided, why not? It's a very modern house, and so I had a hankering to do some decoration. You cannot decorate a, a modern house in a Victorian style, because we've selected one room that we're going to do our best to make Victorian. And so we went out and bought books, we looked at movies, um, we selected wallpaper, we got crazy. What can I say? So basically, so you have this Victorian room in a very modern sort That's of house. That's correct. It's totally anachronistic. So you, you would never expect to see this. So you invented steampunk. <laughs> our idea when we first did this, of no, course. Wasn't. We just wanted to make an environment. We wanted to uh, have a room, actually, that if Haggard were alive, he would feel comfortable in having a pipe or a cigar or whatever it is that he, you know, smoke. I mean, he would feel comfortable there having a drink. I, you know, I, I got I to gotta tell you, though, um, <laughs> in the Victorian room, I can see you like, maybe having one and having a pipe, but if you went, it's a Victorian room, and everything in it is based on you. <laughs> <laughs> Could, could be just a little, I don't want to say awkward, but it could be just like, it could be either, you could go one direction, why, yes, of course, how would it be otherwise? Or other, other, other direction would be, hi, here's the restraining order. <laughs> well, I, I think he would react the way modern authors do. He said, you did, you did that with my book? You chose that 
artist to do my book, you know, like, you know, like the death dragon can't fly, you know, the wrong wings, it's the, it's the wrong costume. This doesn't look like that of the lily. This is not quite the direction I would go in, but exactly. I guess I can. What were you thinking? The only other house I know that actually has theme rooms is the White House, so, you know, so I think you've done, well, no, that and, like, you know, the dudes who, like, you know, put a, put a ping pong table in their, in their garage and then call a man cave. So, well, we have thought of that. You know, what happens when we sell this house? What the heck are they going to do with this? You know, it's, you know, it's a 19th century mantle. It's, you know, uh, furniture, rug, everything in the room is just... As, they, put a, they probably would put a pin down, you know, some sort of billiards table in there and use it for a game room. Yeah. Right? What well, else can they do? Now, when you mentioned that, I'm actually thinking of the room of the, the movie Beetlejuice, where the, where the wife is going through, like, I'm going to destroy this room, I'm going to destroy this room, and finally the guy, you know, goes into the study, he's like, no, you can do anything you want to the rest of the house, but this is mine. <laughs> I can definitely see some, some guy going in there, it's like, I like this. I like, oh, we're going to cut down the, the wall, but no, you won't. And he takes up a pipe. You know, starts having brandy sniffers and you mean puts on a velvet coat, stuff like that. You will have done this. You will have done this. <laughs> yes. I'm not making you nervous here. Oh no. <laughs> not at all. Oh boy. So, uh, last question, which probably should have been the first question, which is frankly, and, and this will be a sort of a lead on because you are actually having uh, a guest of honor interview. And so, as, as a small taster, you know, um, what prompted you just in the first place to get into artist agency at all? Because that's, you know... Well, that's about five or six slides of my oh, okay. talk tomorrow. I'm not going to be... Inter I'm interviewing myself, actually, oh, okay. as my own talk. Uh, you but don't? The, huh? Am I going? <laughs> you don't talk? I'm going to be late. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. no, no. Uh, what got me started to be a... Hmm. To collect or to be a dealer? Oh, just, just, they're two different things. Just collect, just collecting came way before. Collecting came when we first started going to conventions, back in the days of, oh, when was it? I guess the mid-70s, to mid -70s, mm -hmm. I suppose. So living in New York, we started going to Lunacons, uh, the like boarding hotel, you know, out by the airport. Sure. And um, while Howard was busy buying books, because books are his thing, mm -hmm. I had nothing to do. Right. Uh, you know, I would say, how about this one? He said, I have that one. How about this one? No, I need that one signed. You know, how about this? I, I got tired of this. got very tired. So I don't know why. I, got, I, went, I went to the art show, and lo and behold, I discovered that there were people who were actually painting the covers of all the books that we were buying. It was mind-blowing. And so I just spent my time in the art show, and pretty soon I said, you know, one day, one day you're going to run out of buying books, and then what are you going to do? To buy art. Mm. And you know, that day came. <laughs> <laughs> well, Jay, I'm looking, uh, very much looking forward to coming to, your, to the room of your house, putting on my velvet jacket, maybe having a smoke. So, ladies and gentlemen, Jay and Frank. <laughs> I'm going to come back to uh, a person with uh, whom I have a special connection. It's not that way. Peggy Ray Sapienza. But first, Kendo! Visit the art show in the Regency Ballroom of the West Tower throughout the weekend. And for the low price of $10, you can take home a gallery of the exhibiting artists with this year's High Gloss Artist Showcase. All right. Available uh, in the art show or through sales to members of <laughs> the Grand Ballroom Foyer. Excellent. The special connection I have with Peggy Ray Sapienza is that uh, she, is, she ran the Nebulas for the last two years while I was president of CIFLA. And I got to tell you, she made me look fantastic. So for the next five minutes, I plan to make her look fantastic too. Ladies and gentlemen, Peggy Ray, Sapienza.
twice as good half as fast. So, uh, so I, I want to tell a little story on you, just so, so we have some, uh, some background here. As I mentioned, I'm, I'm the president of the Science Fiction and Fantasy Writers of America. Uh, by the way, CIPLA members in the audience, uh, 9 o'clock on Saturday, you have a CIPLA business meeting. If you're not there, I will come and kill you. Uh, but we, we, do this, uh, we do this thing called uh, the Nebula Weekend, and uh, where we give away the nebulas, you might have heard of them. They're a small award, you know, kind of a hipster thing. Um, and, uh, and Peggy Ray has run them, ran them for the last two years. And the first year that uh, she was running them, uh, I kind of sent her an email uh, going, okay, you know, this is fine. What, what's going to happen is eventually January is going to come around, and then I'm going to become a lot more involved in, in the, the Nebula process. And uh, so immediately I get a phone call, and it's Peggy Ray, and she says, what do you mean involved? <laughs> And I said, what I mean by involved is I'm going to let you do anything you want to do. And then every once in a while you'll tell me what you're doing and I'll say, that's great, go ahead and do that. And then we'll be fine. She's like, that's right. <laughs> I'm not terrified of you. I just want that. I just want that out there. But I, I will say, especially since the last two Nebula uh, uh, award ceremonies, if I do say so myself, uh, and the Nebula weekends themselves just basically went off without a hitch. Not that you know about. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. This is my point. There is like I'm the I'm the president of Civil and I'm like, how's our things going? She's like, oh, they're fine. <laughs> no, not it's true. Not true. I told him. Here's what I'm worrying about right now. I will tell you when you need to worry about it. In the meantime, I'll worry, I'll fix it. And yes? And that's the way it was. There are some shallow graves outside of Washington, D.C. <laughs> <laughs> but that's not my problem. <laughs> that's what I appreciate. And some of them have many bodies in them. Uh, I have never, <laughs> never cross Peggy Ray. There we go. But that wasn't, you know, the, 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 the Nebula Award ceremonies weren't your first time at the rodeo. You've actually oh. done the World Con. Yes. And you're forgetting the first Nebulas I did. I would, oh, do tell me, because I, I don't think I was, when were those? You were, that was down in Cocoa Beach. Oh, yeah. With Stephen Silver, who's around here somewhere. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, six weeks before the Nebulas, <laughs> got a call from Russell Davis, your immediate predecessor, right. who said, could you pick up the nebulas and make them happen this year? <laughs> and so Stephen and I talked and went, okay, we've never worked before with each other before, but that'd be fun. And by hook or by crook, we pulled that off. You know what my favorite part was? That whole thing where you arranged the shuttle launch? I don't know how you did that. <laughs> but that was awesome. So well, I'm happy to accept you any credit, whether or not I deserve it. <laughs> I just see imagine she's like, oh, shuttle launch? I know a guy. <laughs> uh, so fan guest of honor. That's pretty, that's pretty awesome. It is so cool, and I want to let you guys know that I just feel so loved and so cherished by the community. And I'm so I paid them to do that. <laughs> I appreciate that. No, wait, wait, not yet. That's like, that's right. You're paying me in a Hugo. <laughs> Ah, so but what are you? What is so? What is what is being the fan guest of honor to you? I mean, what are you? Are you just the people come up to you and you're like, I'm a fan because that's what I've done. What it entitles is being gracious all the time. Damn, that's hard. It is. <laughs> everyone says to me, well, not everyone. Only about eight people so far. Oh, but you're gracious all the time, and I'm going. Oh, I'm so glad I managed to pull that off. <laughs> now you are, if, if I understand, you are second generation fan. You're I am indeed a second generation fan. In fact, 
My father was Jack McKnight, and those of you who have been to, done the gruesome thing of looking through the official papers of the World Cotton, which are in every souvenir book, will see his name because he machined the first Hugos. Because he had nothing better to do that day. No. Milt Rothman was the chairman of the World Con in Philadelphia in 1953. And I don't know who got the brilliant idea of doing the Hugos, but they decided this would be cool. Milt got someone to arrange to have the Hugos themselves. They had a design. That was fine. A couple months later, Milt checked to see the progress and well, we couldn't do it, but we were busy and we didn't think to tell you. <laughs> and then they appointed someone else. This was when World Comes had a one-year lead time. So a couple months is a big chunk. Uh, this happened four times. <laughs> <laughs> this, is why, this is why I know now why you're big on process. Yes, <laughs> yes. exactly. Yeah. First time is, is a fluke, second time is bad luck, the third time is enemy action, the fourth time, shallow grave. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So, ten days before the convention, <coughs> Manny Staub, who was a drawer, and my dad, Jack McKnight, who was a wonderful machinist, were asked whether they could pull this out. Mm -hmm. And find, because they had the technical expertise, they would be able to talk the same language as the people, the companies who would manufacture sure. it. That made sense. So they did that, and then two days later they checked with them and they said, this is too hard, we can't do this. <laughs> <laughs> I've got to lay it in the backyard, come on, kids. Exactly. So they went through three more in that 10-day period of companies who agreed to do it and then backed out. So my dad spent almost all of the World Con in his own backyard in his machine shop making the Hugos. And he never called them anything other than those goddamn Hugos. <laughs> Well, hopefully when you see this year's Hugo's, you will not be sitting there going, God damn! <laughs> I think, it, I think we'll, we'll all have a really good time with those. But, Peggy Ray, I'm so glad, I'm so glad that I get to be your Toastmaster of all. Absolutely. And yeah. everyone, Peggy Ray Sabianza. Yeah. Well, you'll meet a man who didn't land on the moon, but made sure other people did. It's Cy Liebergott, and he'll be here as soon as Gundo tells you what he has to say. ShyCon is creating a live exhibit during the run of the convention. We are gathering digital photos taken by our photographers and any members who want to donate their images to the exhibit. If you wish to participate, you can bring your digital photos to the fan table area of the concourse, or email the photos to the address listed in the newsletter. Excellent. I was maybe two months old uh, when man first landed on the moon. And I gotta tell you, I was so excited I pooped myself. <laughs> <laughs> this man is responsible for me pooping myself. Ladies and gentlemen, Sai Liebergott. Johnny. <laughs> I don't know if I actually pooped myself. I'm, I'm just going by what my mother told me at the time. Oh, so, uh, but uh, yeah, we're all we're all getting older. Uh, apparently so. But the but the good news is that I haven't pooped myself in days. So that's really the most important thing. Um, I'm actually going to lead off with I guess something that's probably a little more serious. Uh, uh, Neil Armstrong yeah. uh, passing away this this last week. And I, I have to tell you, I mean, I was at a friend's house uh, with, a, with basically with a bunch of geeks. When it I see four lights. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll fix that. Uh, but I was with a bunch of bunch, bunch of geek friends, and, and you know, uh, we found out, as so many people find out news these days, via Twitter. And just sitting there, and we all literally just went silent for about five minutes, thinking about 
Neil Armstrong on the moon and everything it took to get him there and uh, you know there and back safely and uh, and so I, obviously I mean I mean you knew you knew Neil you knew you were part of that mission I mean when you when you heard the news how what what, what was going through your head well I just that he was only five years older than me <laughs> <laughs> we're uh, <clears throat> we're all starting to fade out uh, in my autobiography I keep a uh, uh, I started a, a appendix called In Memoriam, which I, I listed at least in the first and the second edition. Mm -hmm. Those who have passed away, they were my immediate flight operations colleagues, and the number is up to 92 now. And it's, uh, I think of that when I think of, and I'm not, not including the astronauts who are all five years older than most of us. Right. The thing that I remember, and, and I did comment about this in my book, when asked, how did we do it? Uh, there's two sides to that. One is the hoax, that is. And I always say, let them keep wondering. <laughs> now we spent all the money to hoax it once and then hoax it another six times. Right. <laughs> but uh, we, uh, uh, one of our, my flight operations colleagues, uh, uh, Chuck Dietrich, who's a retrofire officer, he was asked one time, uh, how did we do it? And he said, it was done by a bunch of smart guys who could think straight. And uh, I don't think we have that now, unfortunately. But uh, yeah, with the deal was. I'm just on my panel, so you hear more of that. <laughs> I've become kind of cynical over the years. But, uh, uh, but it was it was something that was that was fairly remarkable. I mean, uh, I remember you know being a kid, just imagining you know it's like of course by the time that I would be the age I am now, that we would have the, the space stations that, you know, you would be up there, you know, uh, the national drink at the space station would be tang, you know, everything would be good. You'd land on the moon for, for your, your moon vacation and you would, you know, trek around tranquility base. You would, they would have cordoned it off so that you didn't actually track your own you know, uh, footprints where, where Neil's footprints were. Oh, the Chinese will bring some of that stuff back. Oh, yeah, well, that's good. You know, it's, it's really important for, for, for that to happen. But uh, I got I to gotta tell you, we were, we were thinking about planning what we were going to do uh, for each of the, uh, of, of the interview folks. And originally, we were going to do audiovisual for, for each of you. But then we realized that, that would be seven or eight uh, opportunities to screw up horribly. So we didn't do that. Um, but I got to tell you, the one that uh, I, I'm most sad that we didn't do was the one that we had planned for you, which was there's a video game called Lunar Lander. <laughs> I got a feeling I would fail that one. And, uh, well, no, 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 it wouldn't have been you playing it. I would have tried to land under your direction. <laughs> I think we both dodged a bullet in that oh, particular time. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but, 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 but you gotta, you, you gotta tell me because I, I gotta know. I mean, you're you're sitting there uh, with Apollo 11 and Apollo 13, and, and uh, so much of the responsibility actually falls on your shoulders to to get them there, uh, to get them back, or in the case of Apollo 13, to you know just get them back alive. And uh, how do you how do you how do you deal with with that sort of pressure. I mean, you've got, yet you chucked some dude a quarter of a million miles out into space. I mean, that's all, it's not a trivial thing to do. Two things that I can answer. It's training, and I hate that, that old saw about, and then the training kicked in. You know, it's bullshit. <laughs> you either train or you're not. It doesn't just kick in. Uh, we had an enormous amount of training, and we, we flight controllers who were in the mission, op, mission control room uh, actually considered ourselves uh, the ground astronauts much to the chagrin of our astronaut colleagues. <laughs> but back in those days, and you'll hear this in my talks, I mean, I've got my, my talk uh, tonight is the, sure. the, the, the kickoff of uh, the longest hour, because all the Paul 13 stuff happened on the last hour of my eight hour shift, but it was the longest hour. And uh, uh, you'll hear some of how all that happened. Uh, training, we, we had an adversarial relationship with our training people. Uh, they had in the mission control room. In some of the pictures you can see there was a uh, off to the off to the right was a glassed-in wall, and that's where the training guys would sit. And they would run a mission simulation, which was very realistic, and we took them very realistically. And they'd stick in a fall, and then see what we would do. They would be based upon our procedures or or our uh, flight mission rules. 
And uh, uh, they took great glee, it was very adversarial back in those days, in, in screwing us and making us look bad. In fact, one of the guys that was in the back room, he used to just laugh with glee, and his name was Goodwill Murray. <laughs> I never knew that until I started writing my autobio, and I just think, his name was Goodwill Murray. And it is. It's listed in the mailing list that way. That yeah. was his name. And uh, I ultimately took a rubber chicken and write, wrote SIMS down Sims down the chicken, and we threw it at the window. <laughs> But the fact that they did that meant that when the real thing happened, you didn't panic, you went and did it all. Yeah, we, we tried to train for everything, but sometimes the guys, uh, the training guys, would just stick a fault in just to see what would happen. Mm -hmm. No reason. And they did that on Apollo 10 right. training simulations. And Apollo 10, they did that, and it was the loss of both hydrogen tanks that fed the fuel cell, electrical power plants. That is, loss of all power. And they put it in two hours within two hours of the time it actually happened on Apollo 13. Is that spooky? And I killed the crew, by the way, on that one. <laughs> Sir, I smell conspiracy. <laughs> well, Sai, I, I have to tell you, uh, not that I don't love each and every one of these people, but sir, it's a real honor to meet you. Well, thank and, you. And thank you so much for being here with us uh, at this World Con. It's really great to have you here. You may have heard of this little prize called a Hugo. Uh, we're going to show you one. Uh, but first, message from convention staff. Go. Tonight, all ShyCon 7 members are invited to attend a free private event at the Adler Planetarium, the Western Hemisphere's oldest planetarium. Buses will depart from the East Tower main lobby and will run continuously from 6 through 11 p.m. Admission to the Sky Show is available for a small fee and your ShyCon 7 membership badge will get you free admission to the museum through Monday. All right, uh, we have a really special treat for you. Uh, usually, uh, the Hugos are not unveiled until right before the actual ceremony. They put all the nominees in the back room and they unveil it to them, and they basically let them salivate over it for about a half hour. I mean, seriously, the thing gets sticky and gross. Uh, we decided to be a little more sanitary this year, uh, and we also want, we also think that this year's uh, Hugo is something that you're gonna wanna see ahead of time, because it's really something special. Uh, so, uh, our next guest is the Hu designer of this year's Hugo Award, Deb Kosiba. slideshow thing that we're yep. going to do. It's all set up to go. I've right. got a speech of pie and everything. Okay, so all I have to do is say, take it away, Deb, right? All right, well, I'm going to stand. Cause... Okay, go ahead and do that, and Deb's going to tell you about oh, this thing. Oh, my slide. Be... Yeah, you can <laughs> actually see what's going on. It's really important. So. Yeah, they were right. I can't see anything. Right. <laughs> there's, there's only a thousand people in the room. There's no need to panic. Right. From the moment I learned that Chicago had won the bid to host the 2012 Worldcon, I knew that I would be submitting a design for the Chicago-themed Hugo Award base. I dipped deep into my art history lessons and architectural knowledge of Chicago, and used the inspiration of three great masters spanning almost 100 years of Chicago history. Okay, first slide. <laughs> My first inspiration is the grandfather of modern architecture, Louis Sullivan. Sullivan came to Chicago in 1873 and pioneered the use of steel in architecture. This radically changed how buildings were designed and almost completely removed any previous limits on height. This ushered in the age of the skyscraper. He practiced architecture in Chicago for over 50 years. In that time, he designed a building for the World's Columbian Exposition, and he designed the now-demolished Chicago Stock Exchange building. To honor Louis Sullivan, I chose a type of glass called blue chip that has an organic leaf-like form, which is reminiscent of the highly ornate designs at the entrance of the Carson Peary Scott & Company building. 
Next slide. <laughs> My second inspiration is Mies van der Rohe, who is the father of the glass and steel skyscraper. After World War I, steel was much more widely used as a building material, but it was usually hidden under a facade of more classical ornamentation. Mies rejected this. He abandoned decorative ornamentation completely and started designing buildings with the structural steel exposed for all to see. For 20 years, Mies was the head of the School of Architecture at the Illinois Institute of Technology in Chicago. He passed his philosophy on to the next generation of architects, who then filled Chicago with glass and steel skyscrapers. I honor the vision of Mies van der Rohe by leaving all of the structure exposed in my stained glass piece and also by the use of a steel load-bearing plate under the Hugo rocket. But the biggest influence in my design is the French artist Pablo Picasso. In 1963, Picasso was commissioned to design what would become one of the most iconic landmarks of Chicago, a sculpture that would later be referred to as just the Picasso. <laughs> to this day, no one is sure what the original object is supposed to be. <laughs> Some thinks it looks like a baboon, some say it looks like an Afghan hound. But art historians currently believe that it is the profile of one of his models, which you can see if you look from just the right angle, and I've actually included that angle, but you can look over her shoulder and see her nose and her lips and her hair. She's hot. <laughs> <laughs> it is this instantly recognizable Chicago landmark that I use as the inspiration for my overall form. It has been a privilege to design the Hugo base for my home city, and I am honored that my design was chosen. Thank you. You can bring that over here anytime you want. All right, there you go. Holy moly! Goodness gracious. It's got wings. <laughs> I mean, it had wings before, but I mean, these, yeah. Oh, this is beautiful. Thank you. Yeah. I'm not just saying that because I'm the Toastmaster, and I, I don't want to sit there and go, my God, what were you thinking? But no, this is uh, a very, very cool way. I'm just going to put that. <laughs> yes, I'm told I gesticulate when I talk, so over there is good. <laughs> yeah. I'm just going to put this back here. <laughs> Shush! Don't give me any really good ideas. Uh, although, actually, this is a really important thing. Uh, one of the th you look at this and you're like, this is gorgeous. And the next thing you think is, oh my god, how am I going to get it home? It, uh, I actually not only designed the base, but I designed specific packaging just for it. There's a, everybody's going to get a box with the foam that's all been carved just to fit it, and that space just for the rocket. Um, when I came back from Glasgow, I had to I had actually have one of those in my suitcase, and this was shortly after 9-11. <laughs> and because I only had so much vacation time, I was one of the first people coming back. So I'm in the airport, I'm like, okay, I have this thing in my suitcase, it looks like a rocket, but it's a trophy, really it's a trophy, it's right up in front, I'll show it to you, let the bank tailors know. <laughs> I gotta tell you, uh, I'm nominated this year, and uh, one now, of course, I have lust. The other thing is, I'm gonna, I gotta tell you, I'm gonna put it somewhere the cat can't get it. Yes. <laughs> have, have you seen that YouTube where uh, the YouTube video where it's just a cat like sitting there, like some guy's got his, you know, uh, a, 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 like cup, and the cat just likes looking at him and just goes, bam, <laughs> and looks right at the guy who's making the video, going, "What are you gonna do about it?" <laughs> I just totally see the cats going, yeah, it'll break his heart. <laughs> Tuesday. <laughs> now, this isn't your first time at the rodeo, is uh, it? No, this is actually my third time. My first time was uh, 2005 in Glasgow right. and 2006 in L.A. Um, and it's interesting that TorCon was your first convention because it was at TorCon that I found out that the base design is typically done by competition. Yeah. And uh, I looked at the instructions on the website and went, <laughs> and now you've done it three times. Three times, yeah. And it's been awesome. It's, it is, a, I, I have to say, you know, no one's going to look at this and go any, any, anything other than, yep, Chicago. So well done, you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, that's just
talk with the man with the plan, Dave McCarty himself. But first, a message from the convention staff. Bendel, ShyCon welcomes your comments and suggestions through a series of feedback sessions. Please check your pocket program for daily times and locations. <sighs> All right. It takes a certain kind of someone to think that running a world con is a good idea. <laughs> That's all I'm going to say about that. Here is that person for this year, ladies and gentlemen, Dave McCarty. A little cat hair on my head, spreading terror, fear, and dread. I'd sail the sky. Five, ah. two, three, four. Yeah, four. You recognize that song, don't you? Yes, I do. Tell us what that song is. That song is Flying Monkeys. <laughs> um, and tell us what that means to you. Uh, so when I, uh, when I agreed to do this idiot job, um, I knew that I had to take several people down with me. Because um, uh, there's... You know, I'm, I'm a wonderful idea rat. I'm a great leader, and I suck at organization. Um, so I needed lots of help. And I turned to uh, Helen Montgomery, who I could never do a convention without. And we added... We had Stephen Silver, uh, who was the connection to the history of the world that I did not have. Right. Um, and we needed, and that, but that was a whole lot of Chicago connection, and we needed, we thought we needed an outside voice, because when it's, you know, we, we'd end up some, in some wheat field in Wheaton, and everybody else would be going, what the hell, it's supposed to be the Worldcon. And so we asked uh, Bobby Armbruster, our pro from Dover, from Los Angeles, to join us. Yeah. Uh, so uh, so we, had a, we had a group of four, and, you know, uh, and at Los Angeles, uh, LA Con for, uh, uh, the, the chairman, uh, Christian McGuire, had been handing out these ribbons that I thought were hilarious that said, Chairman's Flying Monkey, which he would hand to his people who would solve problems. And I'm like, oh, I've got my flying monkeys. And so I'm like, okay, so we're the flying monkeys. And I send off my little email request. I'm like, I need an email group. And we should call it Flying Monkeys. And I can't spell. Um, <laughs> so I, I evidently fell back to my youth. And it's monkeys, M-O-N-K-E-E-S. -E um, and... Uh, and, and suddenly that's in existence, and, so, and you know, they point out to me that it's misspelled well after it's all created. I'm like, oh, oh, and they're like, but then, of course, my name's Dave, and I guess I can be a decent Davey, and Helen's a good Mike uh, Nesmith, and Steven's an awesome Peter Tork, and, and Bobby told us if we tried to let anybody else be Mickey Dolan, she'd knife us. <laughs> So, uh, so, so collectively, we're the flying monkeys. There you go. Yeah. It's it's nice when your screw up actually can be rolled with. And, and hey, it looks like a plan. It's a rock show. Who knows we did anything? <laughs> <laughs> well, and that could actually be a theme for for actually just running a convention, right? You know, as long as to to go back to to Peggy Ray, you know, as long as everybody out there has a good time, it doesn't matter what happened on the backstage. So absolutely. Yeah, and so basically, what you're telling telling us is it's complete chaos, but you're not going to let us down. Yeah, well, I think there's a plan in here somewhere, and um, and fortunately for me, I have you know 500 of the best, most competent staff in the world that they're out there somewhere. God, thank you for making me work. Yeah. This would not be the time to tell you that when I came up here on stage, I absolutely had no idea what I was going to say, right? Yeah. Well, that's right. <laughs> so we go with our gut. Let me tell you about my childhood. <laughs> Now, I have a note here, actually, uh, that says, shout out to past Shycon chairs. So I'm going to actually let you do that, because oh, you know, you no, know no, a little no. bit about now, that. Now I'm on the spot, and I'm on stage, and I'm going to get it wrong. Right. But of course, we've got, we've got, uh, Ur we got uh, Earl Korshak here, who I ran into. You know, I didn't even realize we had a, a, any chairman from Shycon one still with us until I was at Reno last year. And Stephen grabs me and says, Dave, do you know Earl Korshak's here? Sure. And I'm like, Really? And, you know, oh my God. And so this connection between 1940 to now, and um, honestly, it was a very emotional moment for me getting my picture taken with him. I, it was uh, something that I, I'd never envisioned. Um, now, uh, the Shikon, the, the second convention in Chicago was actually not called Shikon. It was called uh, the 10th Annual Science Fiction Convention, TASFIC, 
colloquially inside the inside you know fandom, it's usually referred to as Shaitan Two, but it, you know its name was Tasfic. That was run by Julian May, right. who is uh, unfortunately for health reasons not able to travel. Lives out in uh, in the Seattle area, yeah. um, and uh, but but is still with us. Um, for Shaitan Three, Stephen Silver is going to shout two names because I'm lost. Earl Kemp. Earl Kemp. Sorry, Earl Kemp. And was it Earl Kemp by himself? Just Earl Kemp. Um, Earl, Earl is. Uh, Earl will be participating in a Shaitan Chairman's panel tomorrow with me. Uh, we will be skyping him in from his home in Mexico. Um, so it's nice to live in the future, isn't it? Absolutely, it's awesome. Um, and then uh, Shaitan Four was. Was Larry? Larry. Yeah, Larry Proper and Austin Pratlack, both of whom unfortunately we've lost. Um, so, uh, and then Shaikhan 5 was Kathleen Meyer, um, who made, I, she's here somewhere. Um, <laughs> I, I haven't seen Kathleen yet, um, but, but I'm looking forward to seeing her and, and having a chat with her. Uh, and then uh, Shaikhan 2000 uh, was, uh, of course, Tom Veal. Yeah. Uh, who's actually our corporate treasurer, and while you guys think that all this money you sent in is buying this Rocon, we're financing this on my credit card, all of your money went to Tom's house in the Bahamas. <laughs> it's a lovely house. It's a lovely house. He tells me there's a room for me there. Yeah, actually. Sanctuary, basically. Yeah, yeah I'm fleeing as soon as I'm off the stage. <laughs> It's a fine lineage of people to be associated with. It's, it's, it, it's, it's very awesome to feel so connected to something that comes from far before me. Mm -hmm. um, this is, you know, this is the 70th Worldcon, oh my god. Um, you know, it's, it's just, it's amazing to, th to think of the run and to, to try to help, you know, drive it forward to the future. Yeah. Well, I, I gotta tell you, uh, I remember when you called me and you were like, dude, 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 you wanna... Do, just do this, and I'm just like, okay. And then it was, and I felt like, oh God, what did I just get myself into? But I have to say, uh, just working with everybody here has just been a, a fantastic experience. I, I, I deal with Helen all the time, uh, John, who's, who's running this, and, and uh, just everybody who has really been so polite, and they've all they've all insulated me from the chaos, which I really appreciate. So, really, uh, everyone, if you could just now just give a big hand to everybody who's running this. Uh, I see you every once in a while, and you really have gone from this little dude is going to be some cool dude is going to be It's only it's only about four or five more okay. days, and then and then you're gonna you yeah. can drink yourself into a stupor. And then I will not know what to do with that. <laughs> well, there's always the bid for 2023. Oh God. <laughs> Twenty twenty two. Twenty 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 two. That vote will probably be in New Zealand, and that's the other side of the world. So that's crazy. All that's, right. That would be the way to do it. All right. Now I know that you want at all the folks who are up here on I'd stage. I'd like the, the folks that's up on stage. But, but, but before we finish, I just want to do one shout out to our guest who's who's not here at the moment. Just Go to ahead. Remind, just to remind folks, um, we have a guest of honor who is not with us yet, and I know that many of you are excited about it. I just want to say the name out loud and hear and hear a reaction. Uh, on Saturday and Sunday, we will have Story Musgrave with us. And I'm sure you guys can't wait to meet him. Yeah. Rumor, um, rumor is I might be interviewing him. You, you, the rumor is you may, yes. <laughs> All right. But Better. yes, if the, if the guests could stay on the stage, please, at the end. We have to, just a couple minutes of business to deal with. Great. Uh, but for everyone else, this uh, comes to the end of our opening ceremonies. Thank you so much for coming. We've got four, five, four. Four more days? Five more days? How many more days? Monday. Whatever Monday is. Whatever Monday is. We're going, Monday, it's over. we're going until then. And then you have to go home. And then you have to go home. <laughs> You can't stay here. <laughs>